Okay, thank you so much all for joining us. Um, welcome to Endoscopy Now in today's virtual education program regarding GLP-1 receptor agonist use, considerations specifically for the gastroenterologist and the gastrointestinal surgeon. My name is Carolyn Newberry. I'm a gastroenterologist at Weill Cornell Medical Center and the director of our GI nutrition program. I'm excited to join this esteemed panel of experts and will serve as your moderator for today's panel discussion. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and give a brief introduction for each of our panelists today, and then open the floor for a couple of conversation points. Um, so I already introduced myself. Um, also with us today, we have Dr. Manuel uh, Galveo Neto. He's the Director of Bariatric Research at the Orlando Health Weight Loss and Bariatric Surgery Institute in Orlando, Florida. We have Dr. Anthony Starpoli, who's a gastroenterologist um, at NYU Langhone, and he's the director of the American Obesity Center in New York, New York. And finally, we have Dr. Michael Jackie. Um, he's the uh, Louis B. Uh, Eagler, chair in surgery, the director of the Minimally Invasive Surgical Program at North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois. And so let's get started. These are the objectives of our talk. Um, we're hoping to identify the current FDA approved formulations of GLP-1 receptor agonists currently on the market in the US and abroad. We wanna define current guidelines regarding pre-procedural management of these medications in patients undergoing endoscopic and surgical procedures, as well as the evolution of literature that continues to be out there on this topic. And then finally, we're gonna end with discussing the current landscape of concomitant sequential therapy utilizing bariatric procedures and these novel anti-obesity medications. And so I'm just gonna start with a couple of questions and then we're gonna open up the floor and hopefully have an open dialogue and, and please to our audience members, we'd love to hear your questions as well. And so I'm gonna start with like a very easy introduction and that is what is a GLP-1 receptor agonist and what are the current FDA approved formulations on the market in the US and abroad. And anyone's welcome to take this question. All of our panelists are so excited to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I think GLP ones uh, or glucagon like peptide one is is a uh, receptor agonist or incretin uh, mimetic medications. And, and so they reduce blood sugar and energy and were typically introduced more for uh, diabetic control, but we're seeing good weight loss from that. Uh, so, for, you know, currently it was originally introduced for the treatment of uh, type two diabetes, but now also obesity. And I would add to that, that initially we thought that these might be something so simple as to increase satiety, but we're realizing that they have uh, multiple target locations throughout the body. And uh, it seems like every week we, we hear something new. Yeah, and uh, on the, as the beginning of uh, any obesity medication, just reminding everybody that each 10 to 15 years, there's a new medication that hit the market. Before the GLP-1 analogs, historically, after 10 years, those medications are off the market or they go down on the use. So uh, now it seems very promising. And for the very first time, it seems that we have an effective treatment for obesity. Yes, uh, and medication-wise. Medication certainly right. have a hype about the effective treatment of obesity. And you know, Anthony, we should. There's so right. many, for so many, this hype is needed yeah. for more like we are, trying to get back on that and say, no, 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 we need it. That's a good news. We are treating the obesity with medicine. Yeah. We needed that. And so many people will be looking for treatment right now just because of that. And those people are not even considered treatment because there was no medicine effective as it is now. So I wanted to open that discussion in that way. And, yes. and answering, uh, Carolyn, you, you can say out loud, what are the medications that we have in FDA? Because you have a, a fresh mind. 
Sure. No, I'm happy to review those. And, and yes, as, as somebody who is definitely using a lot of these, we're all using a lot of these medications, but I, I'm particularly interested in sort of the medical therapy and the nutritional management of these patients with obesity. Um, you know, for weight loss specifically, um, we now have two options, you know, in the GLP-1, or actually three options in the GLP-1 receptor agonist class. You know, the first one actually came on the market back in 2014, and no one really talked about it. You know, that was Sixunda, where it was actually a short-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist that was um, a subcutaneous injection. It produced about a 5% total body weight loss. And, and it wasn't actually used, I think, all that often for weight loss purposes. Um, and then obviously everybody on the call is probably very familiar with, you know, what happened in, in 2021, where all of a sudden we had some aglutide, which was very effective. Um, and that was specifically for weight loss purposes that we could use semaglutide. It was on the market previously just for diabetes control, but at higher doses, that 2.4 milligram dose under the brand name Wagovi, it was now approved for weight loss. Um, and then more recently, terzepatide came on the market about a year later, um, also for weight loss purposes, previously available for diabetes, now also available for weight loss. And that has escalating dosages. You start at the 2.5 milligram dose and go all the way up to 15 milligrams. And at that high dose, you know, you're seeing, you know, 15% total body weight loss, 20% total body weight loss in patients after a year of sequential use. And so these are impressive outcomes. We haven't really seen this in weight loss drugs before, but agree, there's also been a lot of other things on the market. And so I think it's important conversation to have about the history so we make sure we don't repeat some of the same mistakes that have happened in the past. How, how do you choose, uh, Carolyn, which which one to use? And, and also, what about the, um, you know, the uh, dual GLP-1 and GIP uh, drugs, I think, set bound. Uh, how do you choose which one to use? How do you individualize the patient use? I guess it's a question for all three of you, really, but um, I guess just starting with you, how would you decide which one to use and which patient? And, yeah, I can comment on that. And I'm curious to hear what Dr. Neto and, and Dr. Starpoli say as well. Um, I think sometimes it has to do with availability, particularly we're finding a lot of drug availability issues of uh, patients actually being able to get the medications, particularly at the starting dosages. There's insurance coverage limitations. Um, and then also the patient's degree of obesity and their other comorbidities, their side effect profiles, et cetera. I mean, I think it's like a very personalized decision and discussions with the patients. And I don't know if you guys have a similar approach when you're looking at whether these drugs are appropriate or not. Yeah, if I, if I may add, and it's like uh, on the top of choose, but medication is like a, <laughs> you end up sometimes in a financial decision for that. Um, the very old eraglutide is good. Just know how to, to use that and be patient and not just jump on the higher dose, but get your patient, Caroline, is just nodding the head because she knows. Everybody, or not everybody, but quite some people just go jump in a higher dose. That's not the way it should. And uh, as I remember, well, it takes three months to get to the higher dose. And now everybody getting one month to the higher dose. So it's a chronic disease. So we have to do a stepwise approach. And I'm going to put to you guys one thing. Guys, the only therapeutics that I know that the results are better in the real life than his studies is in the bariatric therapy. So the use of the GLP-1 analogs on real life is that good? I have my doubts because in real life, what I see is not what the studies are, are showing us. Sorry. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> because I look, uh, the, all the balloons trial, FG trials, the real life results, the post market studies, is almost a double. The ESG that we see, that Mary trial, the real life, the after one is way better. Why? Because we treat our patients with, uh, in the trials, uh, it's free. So the patients take it out or they challenge the device forever. But what we see with medicine, and in general, any medicine that treats chronic diseases, that the results in real life is not that same of the studies. So what is the gap that we have to define? And only the time will tell. Because what is the time 
told us before on the other medications? Well, I'm finding in my patients, like anything, whether it be a procedure or a medication, it's really patient commitment. And I think that I'm seeing the published uh, results on these medications as they are, and, and, and they work. They work not as well in some patients, they work better in other patients. And I think it's, it's really like someone that undergoes w uh, an endobariatric procedure or a, a formal uh, uh, bariatric procedure, surgical procedure. It's, it's the buy-in from the patient. There, I mean, there are many, many factors. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we're seeing pretty impressive outcomes with our um, patients on GLP-1s and GIP um, dual agonists. I mean, they, they are producing sometimes more weight loss than the, than the drug trials, um, but there's a variation depending on how much they engage and whether they're hyper responders or not, and are they listening to, you know, satiety cues. And we see similar things in our endobariatric and bariatric surgical patients as well. So I, I think it's a good point, Anthony, that the patients just really need to be engaged in the program and there needs to be longitudinal follow-up. And, and there's a lot of monitoring, I find. Uh, the patients that just expect a miracle don't have as good a result. You know, you need really the programmatic dietary support um, I'm, we'll touch on later the idea of combined therapies, because I think we would all agree that that's probably the most effective. And what we're combining, we can talk about that later. Yeah, and I think it's a good segue. There's actually a question that I think relates to this conversation, and then maybe we can move into sort of preoperative assessment, because we just wanted to introduce the medication and sort of talk about like our personal experiences. And I know what people really want to talk about is sort of the, the bariatric and anti-obesity medication combination sequential therapy uh, conversation. So one question from the audience um, is just about safety of the medications and sort of if people are finding in clinical practice that patients are concerned about um, long-term safety of these medications, even though many of them not for weight loss purposes, but for, you know, insulin resistance purposes have been on the market for a while. And I'd be interested to hear how people are, are counseling patients out there in practice. Yeah, the, I can tell you I'm biased uh, because uh, I see that specific, I'm a proceduralist and I see the specific part, uh, type of patients. What I see in my practice and the practice all over the world, so in India, Mexico, US, Brazil, is that um, our patients don't understand or it's not reinforced that, that is a chronic, progressive, incurable, lifelong disease. And they were not aware or they don't pay attention that they need to use the medication for life. And they come to, to us and say, I stopped the medication and regain all the way. And the reaction, yes, yes, you regain because you have to use it. We have to keep using because it's chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes. You stop, it stopped working. And uh, that's that's what I see a lot, quite sometimes answering your question. And uh, and then we reconsult this patient and say, look, medication work, you're doing good, you stop. Who tell you to stop? I stop because it's expensive. I stop because nobody tells me to, to keep using that. So that's my bias of, of the people that I see, the patients that I see. The population, I see. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, if you're a diabetic or a bad hypertensive, would you stop the medication? The answer is no. And these are not miracle drugs in the sense that they're a one off. You get a treatment, you're done. This is a chronic disease. And I think the, gr the drugs and the excitement, the hype around this, it just really should be the opportunity to explain just how chronic a disease this is. Yeah, I, I think in terms of side effects, I, I've seen a, I, I've seen them all. I've seen bowel obstructions, interestingly. I've, I've seen the pancreatitis. Um, obviously, the most common side effects we're seeing are the ones related to gastroparesis, nausea, vomiting, bloating, increased GERD. And interestingly, you know, when these uh, a few years ago, when we were a little bit more naive about these, you know, uh, those of us that also do anti-reflux surgery, in, in addition to bariatrics, we were seeing an increase in these patients coming in uh, with worsening reflux symptoms. And I think you have to be very careful and make sure when 
uh, patients are uh, complaining about this, that you, first of all, you, you know up front, this is going to cause gastroparesis. I mean, that's one of the mechanisms, right? I mean, GLP-1 uh, actually is found in compounds like just fiber, high fiber diets. And it's probably why people on high fiber diets are, are, are less likely to become obese because they are using the natural GLP-1 uh, agonist pathway through that, that kind of diet. And so, um, you know, we're, we're going to see slow stomach emptying and all the consequences from that. And so we tell patients to expect all that. And I think it's important because I don't think, at least me personally, we didn't do a great job of that early on because we didn't appreciate, um, you know, how bad the side effects could potentially be. And I think just counseling the patients helps a lot because a lot of patients are seeking help for things that if they just knew what it was, they're okay dealing with it. Um, you know, the side effects of the GI side effects in particular, uh, but they just were confused because they were really feeling a difference. They were feeling more nausea, more bloating, more fullness, more GERD and constipation, which is another side effect. So I think you have to counsel people up front about those side effects for sure. Now, that's a really good point because all patients will get everything you've just described. The question is, how do you super select out who will have that sustained problem, right? Mm -hmm. And the biliary disease uh, is definitely there. Uh, there's plenty published about that. The question is, again, who's the patient that gets that problem? How do you know? I mean, we're not really working up uh, biliary dyskinesia uh, on every patient that gets those drugs, right? We don't know what the underlying process is. So, um, and, and I've seen it. I'm sure you all have seen it. Well, we've been seeing biliary disease for decades, right, with, uh, you know, weight loss surgery. And, and so that's something that we're used to seeing. And, and this is no different because now we actually have medications that are really effectively leading to significant weight loss. So right. not, not surprised to see some of that. But that would be gallstone disease, right, as a result right. of weight right. loss. I, I, I think the other part of this is the effect on motility which is not just limited to the gallbladder, as we've just said about gastroparesis. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it just highlights the need for more like like true physiological studies. I mean, it's pretty scant out there. There's a little bit on the raglatide. Um, you know, actually the raglatide data shows that, you know, there's tachyphylaxis of a lot of these gastroparesis like symptoms, probably after about like a three to six month period, it may be longer in these longer acting drugs, but it'll be interesting to see sort of how these patients settle out. Because I think, you know, in clinical practice, definitely setting expectations up front helps them so much with tolerance of the drug and then actually making targeted dietary changes to look at these symptoms. And sometimes we'll often even use, I'm sure you guys do the same thing, a little bit of anti-emetic or PPI or something up front that many patients actually are able to wean off, you know, six to 12 months into their, their therapy course. Um, I wanted to, to move the conversation um, into sort of, I think it's a nice segue, just talking about gastroparesis into the pre-operative management of these drugs. So I am going to share my screen again here. Um, and, you know, we really want to talk a little about the preoperative management of these medications, particularly what data is currently available and currently being explored. And then I do just have for the audience, um, there are two guidelines right now that have been published, and I'm sure the surgeons are working on their own guideline, but these are from the anesthesiologists who basically just say that for long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, these medications should be held one week prior, so one half-life prior to the procedure itself. And for a daily injection like um, Sexenda, it would be like the day before. Um, and just using things like POCUS, so point of care ultrasound, like day of procedures, sort of risk stratify patients. Um, the American Gastroenterological Association came out with their own guidelines that but really have a lot of words in them, but essentially just say to individualize your um, treatment approach to patients, you know, not that all patients actually necessarily need to hold the drugs. There isn't a lot of data necessarily to support that practice that maybe it's better to just do a liquid diet the day before, but, but there wasn't a lot of published studies when either of these guidelines came out. So we're going to open up the floor on what people are actually doing out there in practice. And I can also take some audience questions as well. Uh, I can start. Uh, I don't buy that. They have to stop one week before I do endoscopy. And I see patients that come to endoscopy without saying that they are using GLP-1. They are quite some full stomachs, full of food. And there is a recent paper, I think it's JAMA last week or so, 
that actually do ultrasonography. And I think it's 80 plus percent of those patients don't have a proper empty from day to another. So, uh, and both, uh, both of the papers that you show, uh, Caroline, they don't have science. They are guessing. No, there's right. no science behind yeah. them. I completely agree. It's it's they, purely they theoretical. Have, I think the first science that I saw was this paper. I don't know if you guys saw it. I, I, uh, last, last week or so, uh, they put ultrasound and they could measure uh, from day to the other the emptying. I don't know if the method is this idea or not, but 80 plus percent of the patients are with food in the stomach. Considerable. So uh, my practice, one week before. Yeah, so, we're, we're the same. We, we've right, been I, a week before, but mm -hmm. it, it's really based not on any, you know, really good data. But I, I think that there are some other society guidelines that will be coming out this year that are going to recommend two weeks. Yeah, actually. there's a, there's a study out of a Texas group. It's a smaller study that found that they're even suggesting a, a month off of those medications. Uh, of course, this is difficult in those being managed, having their diabetes managed. But for weight loss, they're talking uh, a month. That's incredible. But I think we really don't know the answer. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw this paper, but uh, you have a confounding factor of the patients of diabetes. They are predisposed to have uh, slow gas emptying or sure. delay gas emptying. So yeah, I mean, I for think obesity, it is, was this one that uh, they they did recently, and um, uh, I'm pretty convinced that we have to. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the question is, you know, one half life of a drug since the half life is about six and a half days for the long acting medications, probably holding it for one week. I'm not sure it actually is making a clinical difference in patients gastric emptying time. Um, you know, we we currently submitted a manuscript. I'm sure there's lots of manuscripts under review right now, so I'm excited to see what comes out in the next few months. But but we did actually find that colonoscopy same day was protective against having anything in your stomach, which I think does make sense because patients are on a full liquid fast and they do a bowel cleanse the day before. And so potentially we we need to be looking at more like the fasting guidelines prior to the procedures themselves, as opposed to holding the medications, which may have their own implications, particularly for patients that are using it, yeah, for diabetes control. Um, and I, I don't know if that's sort of the direction we're going to be moving in. Cause yeah, if we're saying, you know, hold it for a month or six weeks or eight weeks, at some point it starts to get to the point where, you know, I worry about that actually having more of a negative effect than, than maybe just changing their fasting guidelines the day before. Yeah. So for our patients for surgery or for endoscopy, for anybody that's under going to go under going to undergo sedation or a general anesthetic. Um, we currently, we hold the drugs for a week. We recommend, or we require a 48 hour clear liquid diet prior. Uh, so to what you're saying, and we also, uh, require NPO 12 hours minimum prior. Uh, and, and you may or may not know, but you know, in surgery now, uh, we've gone, we've actually gone from NPO after midnight to NPO and just till two hours prior because there's data to show that, you know, protein, uh, clear protein drinks and so forth actually can increase, um, you know, the quality of the operations for things like anastomosis and so forth. But for patients with these drugs, um, they are asked by our preoperative area, you know, if they're on these drugs and if they are, they should have held them. If they're not, we are actually canceling the cases, postponing them. Um, if they did what they were supposed to do, which is hold the drugs for an hour, they also will have had to have been on a clear liquid diet for 48 hours, and they will have had to fast for 12. And that's very much, much more strict than any of the uh, NPO guidelines prior to surgery or sedation that we've ever had. Interestingly, terzepatide has a, a, a little shorter half-life than the others. Yeah, and the potency, the way that it serologically... Um increases in the bloodstream and, and decreases. I think part of that anecdotally, it actually seems that many of the patients have less nausea associated with it. And, and that's why I think the physiological studies would be so fascinating. You know, GIP having some anti-emetic yeah. properties, you know, is there anything real to that? Or are we just anecdotally seeing it in clinic? Well, I think the point that you made about, it's not just about the uh, drug and, and duration of holding the drug, but also the fasting. I think you're absolutely on to something. I think it's very important. I think people need to, on this call and on this webinar, need to understand that it's not just about holding the drug, um, uh, but it's also about, you know, maybe a clear liquid diet for 48 hours and, and fasting for a bit longer than what we might do normally.
Yes, and there's a number of questions from the audience, a couple of which I think are on similar themes, so I will pull them out. Um, one person just commented that the Canadian anesthesia guidelines may be coming out soon and recommending a longer half-life. So yes, like something like a three, four week hold. So it sounds like there'll be a lot of different guidelines out there that have varying degrees of a medication hold. Um, and then there is also uh, a question about aspiration risk, which I think is a big question for our anesthesiology colleagues. Um, something that the POCUS study, I think, was trying to get at, looking at retained solid gastric contents and showing that there was an increased retention. And we know that is associated with increased aspiration risk. Aspiration still being incredibly rare. And I know there's a couple manuscripts under review right now that show these events are still incredibly, incredibly rare in these patients. But that's certainly something I think we're all thinking about. About. And, and what are your anesthesiologists actually doing in practice? That's it. Question yeah, for the week, group. Uh, one week liquid diet day before, and uh, they not going to do any procedure that in the patient that they know are taking GLP-1 analogs, endoscopy, surgery, they are not going to, this is not going to go to. Yeah, same, same here. Mm -hmm which is probably yeah. a good practice to have. So I think that, you know, I want to leave the last like 20 minutes and then we'll have a few more, 10 more minutes at the end of the session to have questions. But, but this really is going to be the meat, I think, of the conversation. And that's sort of talking about concomitant therapy options for these anti-obesity medications, but the ones that are currently on the market and, and some of the new drugs that are coming in the wings, because we know there are also a number that are about to be um, unrolled. And so, you know, it'd be great to hear people's clinical practices. And I know, Dr. Neto, you also had some um, data that you wanted to actually share with the group regarding some concomitant therapy studies that you've done. Uh, yeah, let me just show you here. Uh, so that's here. That's my new team here in Orlando. And uh, let's start with this one, Liragotite. This is a case match study. So it's an elegant way to do a retrospective st study. And uh, at the end, you have 2626. And Liraglutide was introduced around month five after the ESG. And you can see here how it goes in the difference. So 24 against 20. That's very significant on, on to see. Let's see the other graph. So it's even more uh, highlighting there. And we did a small a randomized trial now with semaglutide. And uh, we presented DW 2021, and this is a preprint. So was randomized double blind because we patients get the, the, the pen. The pen has no mark, only the pharmacy knows. So we don't know what we are doing. We are sending the patient, the patient don't know what they are taking. So this was very, very interesting. I think it's... Uh, uh, it's passing just just a second here. Uh, I think uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it was for the end. So now you guys can see. So this is the results. So twenty five against a chain that is very good for ESG. This one, the uh, SEMA was introduced in month two. So let me just get back to the other one that you're going to like it because it's balloon, it's new. Yes, here. So this one was just published in obesity surgery. We did in India. It's a randomized trial. So we get the oral semaglutide to take advantage of the uh, swallowable balloons that we are talking. So uh, 53 against 55 patients. Uh, the group on the right was just the swallowable balloon. The group on the left was swallowable uh, plus uh, rebellious as they resume the diet and they don't have vomit. So that's the result. Sorry, this is wrong here because it's 17 against 14 or on that. The numbers are just duplicated. I have to change the slide in four months. So it's significant. Rebellious is known now for not have that beautiful results but it will have some impact here. And the patients could tolerate semaglutide plus the device that delayed the gastric emptying the most, that is balloons. And also uh, we have uh, this one in uh, the TOR, 
that is a uh, endoscopic revision uh, of the gastric bypass. And we uh, uh, randomized uh, TOR or plus TOR plus liragotide. And you can see the results here are very, very interesting. And this is a very selected group, and that's the bias of this study, because the results for the TOR itself is very good. 18% is very good for TOR. But when we add the ragotype, we get even better. And it was presented uh, on DDW as well. So this is what I have to show you very briefly. That's our experience. So, and we are experimenting more and more. And uh, on a clinical practice, what I can tell you that if my patients can afford and they do ESG, in between month two to four, they start doing that. My results are almost the same of sleeve gastrectomy, uh, weight loss wise. And we now have two years of follow up. So this, they keep it and we are preparing this publication. So it's data. So Manuel, I have a question. Uh, uh, Michael, you, you muted. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, Anthony has a question first. My question is about the timing of when you either do the procedure, begin the medication, or vice versa, because the Brigham Group has reported that it is important to do, if you're going to do an ESG, to do that within six months of being on medical therapy for a better effect. What, what has been your experience? And I do agree that the multimodality is incredible and would also allow you to have a lower medication dose as well. Go ahead. Um, we don't know. They, they choose that approach. Our approach was chosen. The first one is that less weight, the punch of the ESG pass. So the nausea, so the fullness sensation or stabilize. So that's why we start in month, uh, in month five with liter and not the maximum dose. And right. you're right. And, and they, that's that use it. And also in the clinical practice, we thought we thought that the patients tolerate well because we saw that if you add uh, the late gas emptying for the procedure itself with the drug, patients not going to tolerate. But they, they do tolerate very well, very well. And it's surprising uh, that a gastric balloon, they can uh, they can support semaglutide oral. So uh, what we expected the patient not to tolerate. So you, what we did, Anthony, answer your question. Instead of starting month six, we start before to see, and you, at least through very small trials, for sure. But we see a benefit if you start early on that. I don't have my mind set for that. Uh, my general, I go more for three to four months, but it's empiric. Uh, besides the trial that we did in my, in my clinical practice, but in my clinical practice, my, I offer to all of my patients now for since two years. If they so can afford, the, I offer. I have a question. What do you think about the concept of inducing weight loss with a drug and then converting to procedure and then titrating back for stabilizing the weight loss? Uh, clinical practice. I received so many patients in use of GLP-1 analog that they plateau or they are regaining weight even in use. And then I do the procedure and they get way much better. So I don't know. I don't know. It is, it is not my practice to start before. My practice to start after. I'm a proceduralist. So I see those patients in a different timeline. Yeah, I, I, I personally think we need to think about obesity, which we know is a chronic disease, similar to the way that we treat things like gastric cancer. Um, you know, a patient presents and diagnosed with gastric cancer, they're going to get neoadjuvant therapy, they're going to get surgery, and they're going to get adjuvant therapy. Or esophageal cancer is similar. You get new adjuvant therapy at least, and then you get surgery. And, um, you know, I think we need more data. Uh, we, we have a nice protocol put together, um, a nice... Uh, uh, double-blinded, placebo-controlled um, uh, grant. I think we need industry to help us. Uh, these are, it, they're clearly expensive drugs. And, and I think that we've had some, uh, some uh, interest from industry to sponsor some grants that we can do in a multi-center fashion that would really answer some of these questions. But I think that we've also had the problem with the supply of the drugs. And I think we have to prioritize the clinical use before any research use right now. But I, I hope that 
in the near future, we will have enough drug that we can actually do some really good multi-center trials where we look at, is neoadjuvant uh, use of these drugs helpful? Or is it an adjuvant use that's more helpful? Or is it both or neither? I don't think it will be neither because I think we've seen plenty of reports and I can just tell you anecdotally, we are seeing better results when people are using the drugs in combination with surgery. There's no question. But I think the, the question is, when do we use it? How long do we use it before surgery? Um, in real clinical practice, there's no time period. You know, it's not, we don't tell people, you got to do this drug for six months first, and then we'll talk about surgery. We, we titrate the drug up, we do it. And if a patient is getting a great response, oftentimes we're delaying uh, a procedure potentially, uh, depending on where that patient's weight is. If that patient is presenting with a relatively low, but yet high BMI, and they've lost uh, uh, enough weight where they're starting to see differences in their comorbidities or even their quality of life. Does that patient need to go on to surgery? Probably not. But when you're dealing with higher BMIs, they're seeing, even if they're seeing some good um, effects, we know that a surgical procedure is going to lead to more weight loss than the drug alone. And so those are patients that are going to go on. And when they do, it depends on so many different factors. Uh, you know, their insurance, what their insurance requirements are for how long they have to do uh, preoperative uh, requirements and so forth. So I think in real life, you can't put a time on it in, in our experience, at least it varies. Um, it's easy to say when to restart it. We typically restart the drug six weeks after the procedure, which is typically when most people are back on a regular diet, after, whether it's an ESG or whether it's a surgical procedure. And so that's when we typically will resume it. And then when do we stop it again? It varies if it's patient to patient right now. But I think it would be great if we could get some industry support to really figure out, you know, just like we do with chemotherapy for gastric cancer, how many cycles should we give? When should we give it? And when should we do surgery after we give it? And when should we resume it after? That's just my opinion. You know, the I recent uh, indications yeah. for the cardioprotective benefits of these drugs is, is really pretty huge and will allow the Medicare coverage probably to come. And so those are, you know, other mechanisms of action. So I think the combination and then what's the threshold of where you are have an effective dose for those cardioprotective measures. We don't know those dosings at all. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to say is I'm curious what everyone's doing with the fact that it's difficult to get at times starting doses of uh, Wagovi. And, mm -hmm. and then the patients, right, that come off it then because they need a procedure or something's happened, then they have to go back, but the starting doses are not available, right? Yeah, that I think it's a happens. huge issue. Um, I was also gonna point out, you know, I think that Brigham study is very interesting that you're alluding to, which I believe is still only in abstract format. I don't believe it's been yeah, published yet. Kind of last year, the Lirac, it, and it was with right. Lirac, it was not with semaglutide. So there was one they did with semaglutide where they actually looked at timing because um, I know I've um, shown that um, slide and I should have actually put it here and I'm happy to share it afterwards where you know they sort of reported it was about a 12% I think total body weight loss after ESG if the patient had been on drug greater than six months prior to getting the procedure and then it was a um, like 24, 25% total body weight loss like after um, if they got it within six months. And that's sort of, I think you're talking about like sort of the timing being so important. And one question I actually had for them and I told Dr. Pijam all this was that, you know, are they looking at the amount of weight loss patients had lost when they were on drug, you know, two years ago, or are they only starting the timeline when the patient gets the procedure? Because obviously that's a very different like number. Um, so I think that would be an interesting question to sort of ask that team. And I think that if we could actually have more algorithmic approaches to our patients, and maybe there's a way to risk stratify patients upfront based on their BMI, based on their comorbidities, you know, I, there's been some phenotyping of obesity sort of to understand even what drugs are appropriate for patients, sort of different approaches. I mean, that really is personalized medicine there. And that's where you're really going to get the best outcome. So I think a lot of us are alluding to this and, and we probably do need industry like sponsoring of, of studies, really well done studies that can answer some of these questions. Yeah, the idea of the various phenotypes I think is really important. And we, we it's just not at this point so practical for everyone doing this every day to identify them and then you know take the algorithm where it should go. Yeah, the, and the, the seminar uh, uh, work that started in Mayo Clinic, now that there's a company doing that, that might help us, they already, uh, launch on the market two of the kits 
So hungry brain, uh, hungry gut, emotional hunger, and uh, the hungry gut, hungry brain, emotional hunger, and slow burner. So they already right, right, have two in the market, and this will, this will might help us because you can do it in your office, uh, and if it, it if it proves real. And the other the one thing is Caroline is the the industry of GLP one analogs. So far, they are averse of doing trials with us. Sorry. Yeah, well, hopefully and everyone I, can play I, nicely I in the sandbox I understand, soon, Michael, 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 that we have the to privilege <laughs> the clinical use, but uh, I don't think that we do 300 patients, good study, that we're going to hurt the clinical uh, use of the drugs, but the industry don't want you to do. And yeah, I can see in your well, face, a very good and reading face, all, all of us here have already tried. Well, the interesting thing is they don't really suggest what you do with the patient that comes off of the medication, right? There's some recent studies that show those who had good exercise activities while on therapy did better when the therapy stopped. But that's not something that's encouraged, right? That's something from study. And that, and that speaks to your point, Manuel. Right. And I think it also underscores the importance, you know, also putting my nutrition cap on, you know, I think we're really worried about body compositional changes, particularly with these rapid weight losses. And the fact that there is so much infrastructure around like a bariatric surgery program, but that doesn't really actually exist around an endobariatric program or, you know, these new weight loss medication, like these triple agonists that are coming down the road that are supporting 25, 30% total body weight loss, you know, in published trials, you know, we, I think need to have more infrastructure to protect our patients and, and to look at, lean body mass, make sure patients are getting enough protein, that they're getting dietary counseling, that they're doing resistance exercises. I mean, that's not really in, it's like Pandora's box is open and we have to make sure that we're taking care of our patients now. That's a great point. Uh, I, you know, with my patients, everyone is required to have a registered dietitian and they have to have regular follow-up. Follow -up. It's, 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 a, it's a disaster otherwise. But uh, Anthony, to Carol, Caroline's uh, point, so if you interview all of the endocrinologists in the world, they're gonna say to you, all of my patients are controlled. And then you go to their own country and half of the patients don't have diagnosis. Uh, the other half is not, not controlled, but we might end up on these. And you're gonna say to say, the patients I see are controlled and we don't have infrastructure. That's very important because we cannot, we don't have the reach to cover for that amount of patients that are flooding everybody uh, and they are taken by their own. End of the day, uh, PCP prescribes, uh, they have one or two uh, interviews with PCP, uh, they recommend and they do a good job. They recommend nutrition, uh, counseling, the uh, psychology counsel, but you don't even gonna find it. So, and the overuse without control, I back you, Caroline, in, in your concern. I really back you. And I think actually that's a nice segue because um, some of the uh, people on this conference have some questions about some of the compounding pharmacies that have um, risen up and sort of how we are interacting with those compound pharmacies. And is there actually a chemical difference between what they are, are making in their labs and, and what's actually being um, prescribed at, at pharmacies? I, I think it's a really important question. I know Anthony and I probably see a ton of that in New York City. Um, it's on every street corner, probably you can get an Ozempic pen. Um, and so, so uh, yes, I'd like to hear your experiences um, with with sort of this this type of compounding um, crisis. I almost call it that that's risen. Well, I, I see quite a bit of it, as you probably do. Um, I, I think it's a huge unknown. I think that um, uh, patients are doing things that first of all, people are getting the equivalent of Ozempic. Right, so they're not even really in the right dosing. Uh, people confuse uh, Ozempic as a weight loss drug. Ozempic is a diabetic drug. And I think things like that just perpetuate with that. So, and I've seen some patients get quite ill uh, from some sort of out of control gastroparesis and relentless reflux. And it's very difficult to know what the dosing is that they're getting. So I, I'm new to the country. So I arrived here uh, in January this year. 
So I turned on my radio to, to get better in English and the radio, man, in the morning, it is at least three or four advertisements of compound. They only say, we have the doctors that we will prescribe to you. And that is that aggressive. Very aggressive, right. And, uh, yeah, and cure obesity is what they say. Uh, get rid of obesity. We have the means. In the, we are way cheaper. Uh, we are 20, 20 times cheaper than the, 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 the real one. So it's, uh, I think the country is bombarded with, uh, with this and it's, we don't have any control. I think the FDA is starting to crack down on the online suppliers, but yes, it's rampant. And I think it comes back to sort of that concept of legislation and hopefully everyone on this call is going to work on advocacy and, and just sort of trying to protect our patients by having more infrastructure in place so that 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 those compounding pharmacies maybe because we don't know what's in it. I, I think that comes back to the main question is like you have to confound it usually with some other product. We don't know actually what dosages they're getting um, and it's very hard to take care of patients when they're having side effects and everything if you don't even know what they're taking. I mean, they're often handed a vial and a syringe that they have to draw up. I mean, imagine the confusion. Right, absolutely. Don't and think. in the bariatric surgery patients, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, we were alluding to the fact that a couple months at, they hold their drug maybe for six weeks and then restart the medication. Are you finding that um, they are having side effects again, like when they restart the medication, like, I mean, this is another concern in terms of like oral limitations. I wonder about with patients, because of course I, as the gastroenterologist specializes in malnutrition, see a lot of the really scary cases. So, you know, this probably is not what actually is happening with everybody. No, it, it, it definitely happens. Um, and, um, you know, there are some people that we can't get to tolerate the drug who maybe tolerated it prior to surgery. And, and, and that's why uh, we do see kind of a variety of situations right now. So uh, absolutely can happen. Oh, yeah. and, and just to clarify, we don't typically hold it six weeks prior. I mean, we, we will hold it, you know, usually two weeks prior to the surgery and then we resume it typically six weeks after, okay. so. So it's all for eight weeks total. Right. And, uh, uh, yeah. And, and I, ju I just remind here, guys, that let me tell you my initial experience with that. So when Liraglutide comes to the market, uh, and we are doing tons of balloons in Brazil at that time. So how I start using that is that uh, I saw, we know uh, it is very well known, uh, the rebound of where you remove the balloon, the patient weight gain all the way back. So what I what is, we start doing that in Brazil, and then we, we united in a lot of people in the country was doing is that uh, we need to do something. So what we did is one or two weeks or one month before removing the balloon, we start the drug. And then those patients don't regain weight. They don't lose that much or they don't lose, but they they don't rebound. So just just before I, I forget to tell you that how, how we start doing and using Leraglutides uh, long back, like 10 years. So. And they are safe drugs. They are very safe drugs. Yeah, I think it comes back to the question of how do we best take care of patients? When do we start the medications? How long do we hold them for? How do we decide which patient needs the concomitant therapy? Um, and we are hopefully going to answer those questions here in um, the next couple yeah. of years. And, and I think each one of us has uh, our own opinion on that. So, and 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 Michael. We give a great question, cancer-like. So you go with everything you have, you treat it uh, on the early stage. So obesity is so have such an overlap with cancer. So we, we, now we use the word recidivism. And the only variable to my knowledge that predicts that someone will keep the weight they lose is five years in the same weight. Five years is cure for, sorry, cancer. Yeah. yeah. So shouldn't we get back to the ones who treat like cancer nowadays is a chronic disease. So uh, hypertension is a chronic disease. So 
diabetes. So we have to go there and we should not decide by our own. And we are decided by our own. We don't have guidelines. So the guidelines for diabetes is strict, kind of. The For hypertension, it is. Endovascular procedures and cardiac, open cardiac surgery, they have protocols. The patient don't decide. The doctor don't decide. And what we for and all of our genes is doing now, we decide by our own. There's no rigid protocol. We need studies, but that come to the part of money that someone highlight very well here on the on the on the chat. Where does money come from? Because there is money for cancer. There is money for heart diseases. There are money for hypertension. There is money for diabetes. That money doesn't exist in the level that we need for the worst disease of mankind, that's obesity. That's the root cause of everything we are discussing. Sorry for this, just Manuel speaking. Well said, well said. Well, maybe we, though, can invoke that passion um, for obesity, because I think it has actually shown that it can be a big industry. Obviously, these drug companies are doing well with these new medications. And if Lily is going to build like Lily Direct, you know, where they have a website where patients can go on and click on a link and and meet someone virtually and, and get prescribed a medication, maybe more like infrastructure we can put in place for lifestyle modifications, for dietary counseling, like maybe they can sponsor a dietitian assessment, getting patients to see proceduralists, you know, if they meet certain criteria. I mean, it'd be great if someday we could partner and, and actually use like that money towards combating this disease to put a positive spin on your concern. <laughs> you know, and, and it just to kind of one more, uh, Kind of comparison with cancer, almost every patient at most institutions are treated at a um, multidisciplinary conference where there are oncologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, ra you know, radiologists, and, and so forth. And I think o obesity and the use of these medications that's important as well. And I think one of the questions I saw was wh who manages the di diabetes or who manages the glucose levels when a gastroenterologist holds the, uh, you know, holds one of these drugs. And I think that's another good example of why multidisciplinary care of these patients is very important, you know, where we need to be talking at conferences about our patients, uh, patients with our endocrinologists, with our gastroenterologists, with our surgeons, dietitians, so forth. So um, and just like we do for cancer patients. So I, I, I don't think we should be alone trying to manage someone's glucose, absolutely need to engage the uh, endocrinologists and others. I have a question for everyone, and that is, once your patients have successful weight loss on a GLP-1, and then they go for a refill and they're told that it's no longer covered because they're no longer obese, what are you doing for all of these patients? You. I don't know, because it keeps happening in the last couple months. I think 2024, well, a lot of insurance companies right. made a lot of adjustments to their coverage. Right. And so... I think there you have to think of obesity as a chronic disease. It's really no different than anything else. And the, the advocates, the lawyers, they have to, the, the lawmakers, they have to, to go on our sides and the awareness is minimum. It's, it's, uh, don't get me wrong, we try a lot. We do a lot, but it's still. Uh, we are trying to solve in your question, address something that we cannot solve, but the lawmakers, the advocates, the public have to pressure to that because it's not fair. Yeah, and we just have a couple more minutes left. So I'm looking to see if there's any additional um, questions that we need to answer about you know, th this has been a great discussion and I think we're getting into a lot of really important topics just by as obesity as a chronic disease and sort of how do we combat it in the future? Um, you know, I think we've addressed a lot of the major concerns from our attendees here. If anyone has any additional questions, please please free, free, feel free to share them here and we can go ahead and answer them. 
Um, I think that multidisciplinary care comment is so important. And I, I, that concept that they keep trying to build those patient-centered medical homes around like a chronic disease and Medicare has been trying to do this for a while with disease-related care. Maybe there's an opportunity for obesity to be one of those diseases that, that has that type of compensation model. Um, and you know, we, you know, I'm fortunate that I work in a quaternary care center and, you know, we have an endocrinologist, you know, I have nutrition background, we have a hepatologist that manages the fatty liver, we have the endobariatrician and the bariatric surgeon, everybody speaks and we do have conferences, but I understand that's also not the real world. And I, you know, I, being able to build maybe more telehealth clinics, maybe more ways to connect, I think is really important. I think the thing that makes the difference for people practicing this type of medicine is to realize that there are opportunities for support, even in the community setting. You can identify your registered dietitian. You can identify the right surgeon, the right, and make up your right team. It's very easy, actually, if you want to do it. Absolutely. And it looks like we may have time for, for one more question after that very important comment. And this is actually an approach um, about adolescent um, obesity. And I don't know if anyone on the panel takes care of, of adolescents, um, but the, the question really pertains to endobariatric procedures in this population and sort of what the approach is, um, both with procedures and medications for the adolescents. Yeah, I have been doing that for decades now. And uh, first thing, I have never indicated a single procedure. They are not my patients. So I need two pediatricians. I need uh, one comorbidity. And then we decide collectively with the family to do that. And never before six months or one year of counseling with the families and uh, the team uh, is not something that you can just do. And we published that in our balloon, uh, balloons in, 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 in dollar sense that uh, we have to counsel for at least six months. You have, you have to know this family. You have to know the disease. You have to know what you're treating. Just do the procedures. The, the result's not gonna go. It's, it's, it's a difficult age to be. And yes, we're doing, and also we are doing now, uh, uh, with the with uh, with our endocrinologists, uh, the the use of concomitant or after the remove bone removal uh, the GLP one analogs. Is it, I don't, if I understand well the question. And 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 we are starting to do ESGs as well. So you have two papers addressing ESGs in adolescents, and they are doing they are good results. Yeah, I think that's a helpful approach um, for. Um, that conversation. So, you know, this is a conclusion of our conversation and I'm sure we could talk for another hour, but we are at the, the one hour mark and we really appreciate you joining with us. And I really appreciate um, this candid conversation with all of these esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.